In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I am a perfectionist. I can be pretty annoying at times. Um, I like to be on time even early. Jim beat me this morning. Uh, I, also, grammatical errors. My mother was an English teacher for a couple of years, and she would watch TV, for instance, a newscast, and she would have to, if she heard a grammatical error on the part of the newscaster, she would have to, re, you know, correct him and say, you know, it's, it's to him and her, not to he and she. Uh, you know, and I find myself doing the same kind of thing. Don't get me started on spelling errors that you see on signs or so forth. And especially don't get me started on how you put the dishes in the dishwasher. Because there's a really good way to do that. <laughs> so I can be annoying about that. But there's one area of life that I think I may not be a perfectionist. I'm certainly not perfect, and that's in being a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Do you ever find it difficult to follow Jesus's commands to live out God's word? It's uh, like Mark Twain said so famously, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand. Now I'm not sure if I understand some of today's readings. In Leviticus, the Lord tells Moses, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. <clears throat> so we're supposed to be as holy as God? That, that seems a very tall order. It's a little overwhelming, in fact. Well, what does holy mean? What does that word mean? It just means set apart for God's use, different from the culture or the society, the world's way of doing things. It's about being God's distinctive people, God's distinctive person in the world. And then in Leviticus, God gives some very helpful specifics to explain how to do that, how to be holy. When you reap the harvest of your field or gather grapes from the vineyard, don't take it all. Leave some for the poor, for the alien, for the refugees coming through. That's simple. Leave the, leave the edges so that people who are in need can come by and take some food. Choose to live generously justly goes on don't steal don't cheat don't lie choose to live authentically honestly and justly don't make fun of those with disabilities the blind or the deaf or, or whoever they might be choose to be helpful and positive and just to those in need goes on don't render an unjust judgment against anyone whoever they are rich or poor don't slander or gossip against others Choose to live honorably and justly. So there's a theme there. It, it's a choice to live in these ways. And come on, these are all things we can do if we put our mind to it. They're not impossible. This way of life is holy. It's set apart. It's different from the world around us. It's distinctive. And then Leviticus gets a little tougher here. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So God says it's all about love. Love washes away a multitude of sins. Well, God says, be holy for I am holy. But if these are the things we can do to be holy, then it's doable, right? I mean, not cheating, not lying making a choice to live decently, distinctively, ethically, honorably, generously, authentically, justly, and lovingly. Yeah, that's a tall order. But come on, we can do that. We can do these things, right? But then Jesus kind of takes it even further. Jesus tends to do that. <laughs> He counters the Old Testament saying an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That sounds fair and just, but Jesus says no. Do not even resist an evildoer, he says. If they smack you on the cheek, stand there and turn the other. If someone sues you to take your 
coat, give your cloak as well. If anyone, like a Roman guard, centurion, orders you to go one mile, Jesus says, go the second mile. Go beyond what is right. Go beyond what is just. Go beyond what is even holy. Give to everyone who begs from you, he says. Don't refuse anyone who wants to borrow. Well, come on, Jesus. Why are you making it so much harder? And then he goes on. You have heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, which makes sense, an enemy. But no, not to Jesus. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And then he ends, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, wait a minute. Leviticus, God said, be holy as God is holy. That means set apart, distinctive. But now Jesus says, be perfect. That, that, we can't do that, can we? Well, what does perfect mean? What does that word mean? <clears throat> Caroline Lewis, a friend of mine and a professor at Luther Seminary, explains. She said, the root word, the root word for perfect is telos. And yes, it can be translated as perfect, but the meanings that better capture its essence are completion, intended goal, determined end. In other words, Jesus isn't asking us to be perfect, but to persist in the goal that he has for us. So being a disciple does not require perfection, but a persistence toward bringing the kingdom of heaven to bear on life. One of my Facebook friends posted recently, look at the women in the New Testament who persisted, the widow and the judge. You remember the widow that kept bothering that judge until he ruled? The Syrophoenician woman, the woman looking for her lost coins, Mary taking her seat at the feet of Jesus, despite everything that was going on around, the woman with the flow of blood who dared to touch Jesus, the woman at the well who kept persisting with Jesus, the women who went to the tomb, the sinful woman who washed his feet with her tears and her hair despite the crowd, the, the religious leader's displeasure, the poor widow's offering, his mother asking him to help out with the wine at the wedding, Mary confronting Jesus at the tomb of her brother Lazarus. If he'd have been here, he wouldn't be dead. Persistence, keeping at it. Jesus suggests that an essential characteristic of what it means to be a disciple is to persist in working toward the goal that his beatitudes have in mind. I just read a piece by a Roman Catholic Bishop Robert Barron. And he was talking about this notion that Jesus says of if someone hits you on one cheek, turn the other. And he writes, in the face of opposition or injustice, we have two classic responses, fight or flight, right? In terms of fighting, we oppose evil, but on its own terms. And that tends to awaken uh, an answering violence, an eye for an eye. The flight is just running away from the situation. <coughs> but Jesus is suggesting here a third way. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. If you're, if you're turning the other, you're standing there. You're standing your ground in the face of violence. You're offering a challenge. And it offers an opportunity for the aggressor to see and repent what is going, of what is going on. So persist, yes, but persist in peace. So. Jesus calls us to persist toward the goal which the Beatitudes give witness, to persist in bringing about the kingdom of heaven for all people in the face of continued resistance, to persist in a vision that others might not be able to see, but that you see because you're open to it, not toward the goal of correcting the other person or critiquing or condemning another, but toward the divine end that realizes the full blessings of what God has in mind for all people. Still a tall order. So how do we do this? Paul tells the Corinthians and us 
Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Do you not know that the God of the universe, the all-powerful, the holy, the perfect, the just, the righteous, the loving, the endlessly persistent lives right inside you, filling you right up, ready to go. So what's stopping you? What's stopping me? Be holy as God is holy. Be perfect as God is perfect. Be persistent as God is persistent. Amen. Amen.